Wild Tales is sponsored by Cotswold Outdoor. When we're out in the elements, we're in our element. And outside retail expert Cotswold Outdoor is helping more of us to get out with the right kit. Thanks also to their support, the National Trust is helping walking communities to access the UK's outside spaces. And we're working to fix 15,000 kilometres of paths and trails by 2030 for everyone to enjoy. Find your element with Cotswold Outdoor. Historically, when people would see beetles mating with each other, they'd often assume that there would be a male and a female. But actually, what these scientists then did was prove if you take a closer look, it's often not the case. We can't presume, we shouldn't presume what we know about nature because nature doesn't follow our rules. Hello, I'm Ranger Rosie Holdsworth and today we're looking for a beetle whose flaps caused a flap in entomology and how projecting society onto science has shaped our understanding of the natural world. Can we ever let bugs be bugs? Welcome to Wild Tales, the queer life of a cockchafer. So today I am walking around Osterley Park. It's a beautiful day because now is the perfect time to try and find some insects. This is Connor Butler, an ecologist and entomologist. He spends his days tracking down bugs and teaching others about their weird and wonderful nature. The reason I love insects so much is firstly because they are everywhere. The good thing about that is that you're never bored in life. You can always find insects. And there's something about looking for things that are small and hidden that kind of makes them feel a bit like treasure. They're so pretty when you look at them up close. It's interesting to me that these beetles are so, so brightly coloured. Dung beetles especially, they live their life in animal poo. And yet so many of them are these metallic blues and greens. Why do they evolve this amazing colour? It's bizarre to me. That's kind of why I like them. They just sort of defy expectations of what normality is. Standing under the shade of a huge gnarled oak tree, Connor inspects the leaves of a lush green canopy, the veins shining through its cloud-shaped leaves. And what I'm looking for right now is any damage, any bite marks that could have been done by insects. And I've seen a few leaves I've got these big chunks taken out of. And what I'm really looking for is a really special beetle called a cockchafer. And what they're doing is they're feeding on leaves of trees. The cockchafer goes by many names, a June bug, a May bug, or a doodle bug for their loud and clumsy flight. I call them cockchafers. So cockchafer, the first part of the word, means something that's big, kind of very mighty, because it's quite a big beetle. And chafer comes from the old word for chewing, because all beetles have these chewing mouth parts. The life cycle of this bug is extraordinary. They spend three to four years underground as grubs munching on roots before metamorphosing like a butterfly, sometimes in their thousands into their adult forms. But they also have another claim to fame. Cockchafers were the first ever species of animal to be illustrated depicting same-sex sexual behaviour. Same-sex mating in animals has been documented for hundreds of years, but studying this behaviour has always come up against a problem. Us. Some people refer to this as Darwin's paradox. If sex isn't for reproduction, we dismiss it. This is what makes the 1896 illustration of the cockchafer so special. But it was not a simple journey to get there. It took entomologists six decades to create this image. In 1834, an entomologist and school teacher, August Kelch, came across two mating cockchafers whilst wandering in a forest in Germany. But he noticed something. So the way you can actually determine what sex a beetle is, for cockchafers, is you count the number of flaps on their antennae. And males have got seven flaps and females have got six. And when this German entomologist looked at these two beetles, he realised that they both had seven flaps. They were both male. And so he was very confused why these two male beetles were 
reproducing or attempting to reproduce with each other. And so he thought that it was probably a dominance thing because the, the male European cockchafer is much bigger than the forest cockchafer. The mating was dismissed, but the sightings keep happening in a lemon grove in France, in fireflies dancing above a pond, and more and more frequently in the laboratory of entomologists. But it isn't until 1896 that pen is put to paper. There's a French entomologist called Henri Gadeur de Cavie, and he does the first ever illustration of these beetles. He draws two male cockchafers mating each other. It's a delicate diagram of two beetles linked by their perineum, which looks like a stinger. And when he published this, it was really controversial because, of course, it showed something that was considered to be kind of unnatural. And a lot of people were very negative towards this. But he said it was so common that it kind of showed that there was this intrinsic nature of these beetles to do this. This conclusion began a decades-long argument between entomologists. On one side, Henri Gardecavie argued that some cockchafers were doing it by preference. On the other, a French physician and neurologist, Charles Fair, insisted that the hot-blooded males were tricked into unnatural acts by misleading pheromones. This long argument didn't really teach us anything definitive about cockchafers. We still don't know why some of them choose to mate with other males, but it did teach us a lot about humanity. Now, what's really interesting about the case of the cockchafer is that that kind of bias in society, we're always trying to justify why something is doing something. So if we see two male beetles attempting to mate with each other, we always try and explain away that it could be something that is homosexual, and we do, of course we don't know with nature. But by trying to say that it's a dominance thing or it's um, an aggression thing, kind of, it's quite a closed-minded approach, I think. This explain the gay away is a common phenomenon in natural history. But in many cases, research was buried completely. It's difficult to know exactly how much research has been hidden, suppressed or ignored. But as recently as the 1980s, Dr Janet Mann witnessed more gay sex than imaginable amongst dolphins, but delayed the publishing of her findings, fearful of being pigeonholed and fearful of the misrepresentation of her research. Imagine if you were in the 1890s and you see this drawing of, of these two male cockchafers mating with each other. It was kind of the first time that the idea of homosexuality being something that was natural was brought into science. And so it was really controversial, but also I think it was probably quite powerful for a lot of people to see themselves yeah, reflected in nature. Seeing same-sex behaviour in nature was, and still can be, revolutionary. After hearing about the first discovery of male cockchafers mating in Germany, Karl Heinrich Ulrichs, one of the earliest advocates for LGBTQ plus rights, wrote in 1879, Sexual orientation is a right established by nature. Legislators have no right to veto nature, no right to persecute nature in the course of its work, no right to torture living creatures who are subject to those drives nature gave them. The battle against nature is a hopeless one. That's a really good quote. On many levels, like, it's a good quote. Science is meant to be objective, to give us the facts. But in reality, our science is influenced by society. From the lack of research on women's health to ignoring sex for pleasure in dolphins, our science has bias. Naturalists have long warned against anthropomorphizing animals. The natural world follows different rules to our own. Yet it's something we do time and time again, unconsciously and unquestioningly. So our science continues to reflect our societal values, whatever they might be. And although our society has changed and is still changing, there remains some evidence of the bias we saw 100 years ago. Earlier last year, there was a case of two humpback whales that were found mating with each other. And it was the first time humpback whales had ever been photographed mating. And it turned out 
that actually they were two male humpback whales. And of course, there was a lot of controversy. A lot of people were saying, oh, it's just a dominance thing. It's an aggression thing. But really, we can never know. And that's kind of the whole point. We see homosexual activity in nature. It's really common. If you ever raise chickens or study insects, it's really common to see same-sex couples and same-sex matings. And so all we can say is that it exists in nature. We don't necessarily need to justify why it's happened because we'll never really know. We see in the headlines from time to time, gay penguin dads, gay dolphins, a panic about mushrooms changing sex. But the truth is that these headlines obscure something vital. Sex and gender in nature is more diverse, more expansive and far more fluid than we could ever imagine. It's our assumptions about nature that can limit our understanding. Queer ecology is trying to unlearn a lot of that. And the more we learn about nature, the more we realise that it's incredibly diverse. It doesn't follow all the rules of society. It doesn't follow the binaries. It's really fluid. And I think from that, we can then look at ourselves and realise that actually we're all part of nature and our fluidity is also part of nature. And I think that when you then start to question those things, you look at nature very differently. For hundreds of years, members of the LGBTQ plus community have been told that something about them is unnatural. And looking at bugs may not have the answer to a societal problem, but Connor knows firsthand the impact it can have. So I do a lot of queer ecology walks where I take people out into nature and I look at plants and animals that have kind of unconventional life cycles. And what I find really interesting is that people find it cathartic to see lots of plants and animals with these really diverse life cycles, whether or not they're asexual, if it's a bird that has same sexual pairings, if it's a woodlouse that is changing sex or a tree that is changing sex. And people like to see themselves reflected in nature. It's a hard thing growing up if you're a queer person, especially in today's society. I mean, it's always been hard, but it's good to have people that are connected to, to nature. But it's a slippery slope as well, because there's also lots of really horrible things in nature. There's parasitism, there's murder, there's things eating each other. So really, we shouldn't try and use nature as the basis for what we think is right or moral, and actually should just do what we as humans think is right, which is that everyone should be accepted to be who they are and just be themselves. So as much as you want to take away from insects and we see these same-sex matings, at the end of the day, we're all just trying to get through life and uh, hopefully flip over some logs and see some nice bugs now and again. Thanks for joining me in this wild tale. Do you have an amazing story about the natural world? I'd love to hear from you. You can find us on Instagram at wildtalesnt, where you'll also find behind the scenes moments, nature's giants and the micro wonders that make our world the place it is. Use the hashtag wildtaleswednesdays or email podcasts at nationaltrust.org.uk to send us pictures and stories of the wildness around you. Make sure you get every episode by following Wild Tales on your favourite podcast app. Even better, leave us a review or comment on an episode. I'd love to hear what you think. Did you know we also do video podcasts? They can be found on our YouTube channel or on Spotify. While you're there, why not check out our history show, Back When, or for smaller ears, Ranger Ray and the Wildlifers. See you next time. Wild Tales is sponsored by Cotswold Outdoor, your outside retailer and epic guides to adventure. Quick breathers, calming walks or heart-pounding hikes, we feel better when we get out more. Find quality kit and 50 years of outdoor wisdom. Plus, National Trust supporters get 15% off walking kit in-store and online. Feel in your element, in the elements at Cotswold Outdoor.